Hello, and thank you for joining us. I am Rebecca Highland, and I am running to be the state representative of the 90th district, uh, which incorporates large portion of Wallingford and Middlefield. I am extremely lucky that we have with us today Mary Bashinsky. Uh, she is our state representative from the 85th district, which is in Wallingford, and she is also the deputy speaker of the house. Mary, thank you for being with us. Happy to be invited, thank you. Well, you are the longest serving state rep. Is that Myself and uh, Senator Martin Looney came in at the same time. When we're did the, you start? Uh, January 1981, and we're the last two from that class. I imagine you've had many, many, many rewarding interactions with constituents. They keep electing you. <laughs> I door knock. And the quiet part of the year when I'm not in session, uh, I visited this one guy after the Great Recession, 2008, and he was a skilled tradesman. Okay. He had lost his position due to technology. His trade that he did for decades was no longer valid, and he was in despair over this, and uh, we went outside to talk. He didn't want to talk in front of his family, so we went outside. He told me the whole story. He was working at a a job that was not what he was trained for. It was a low-wage job. It was, very, it was a difficult job, but it was what he could get. I was distressed talking to him because he was trying to support his family. He had kids in college. He had um, parents to care for, and he was not making it on his new wage. That one guy stuck in my head more than anybody else I had talked to. I was chair of program review and investigations, and we did the big picture reports that took six months. When I got back to session, we documented that they were having a harder time going back to work. And to survive, they really needed to be retrained for a new career. And they, had, uh, they needed some computer skills that they never learned in their first trade. Right. Um, they needed to upgrade themselves a bit and need a few weeks of training. But they were really good workers. They showed up on time. They had good work ethics. And we really just had to recreate them for a new position. Okay. Like this fellow. He was yeah. perfectly capable of doing a new job, but he needed some training. We found a pilot program in Bridgeport called Platform to Employment, and I found out they had 94% placement rate, which I had never heard of before. I never heard that high. Yeah. I called the director and I said, if we get you the money, can you go statewide, do the whole state? He didn't even hesitate. He said, yeah, I can do that. I worked with people on appropriations to See if we could get them some more money to go statewide. That's what we did. We made it a statewide program. Wow. Whenever I run into a person that's unemployed, and oftentimes it's because their career has become extinct, I will redirect them into this program. They go for eight weeks. Their new training is subsidized by the state. Okay. And even before graduation day, they get a job. So when I go to graduation, Half the chairs in the audience have their name on it, but not the person. The person isn't there because they're already at their new position. Wow. And they make an uh, average wage uh, after eight weeks of training of, of 54000 Wow. Which is decent money. You can, you can actually keep your family afloat Yeah. with that wage. I'd say of all the bills I worked on, that probably made me the most uh, happy. Is that what keeps you uh, running every two years? Since? I like to fix things. Yeah, See, I like to fix things. Mm -hmm. uh, Is that why you ran originally? Uh, originally, I was working as a public interest lobbyist and organizer. Okay. And I was up in the gallery, and my legislator from Wallingford had had a car accident and was brain damaged. Oh. So he was out for many months, and then when he came back in, uh, he had no memory abilities. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't follow the debate, and he couldn't follow the bills. And I could see that, because I was up in the gallery, right. you know, lobbying the bills. And I could see that he couldn't follow. So one day, it was just like a, a bulb went off in my head. I said, he can't do the job. I can do the job. I know how this place works. Yeah. And uh, it was just like that. It was like a, you know, an instant flash, where I suddenly decided I could do that job, and he really was no longer capable of doing the job. He was a good man, yeah. but he was brain damaged, and he couldn't do the job anymore. I have to tell you that that really strikes a chord with me. I really didn't think that I would uh, ever run for political office. No, I didn't either. I'm a biologist. I never planned to run for office. I'm a, a, a former public defender, and uh, 
former teacher, mm -hmm. and I've always been interested in politics, you know, political science undergrad, but I didn't think I had the chops to actually no, I didn't <laughs> run for office. Like you said, it, something just hit me in the last year, being at home with my son. Yeah. Um, he's three. Yeah. And it struck me that I could do this, that I could do something to actually make the future better for him. Yeah. yeah. That's a similar, similar story. Now, you had kids after you were already elected. Yes. In fact, I met my husband at the Capitol, too. Oh, really? Since I was at the Capitol all the time. But he was a news reporter, and so that was when I met him. He was working there, and I was working there. The rest is history. How many women were in the legislature? It was under 25%. The thing that was different when I was first elected was there weren't very many young women who had not had kids yet. There were only two. The other women that were there were there after childbearing. They had already raised their family. Okay. And they were basically semi-retired, and now they went into politics. So that okay. was really the difference between then and now. It was rare to see young women in office. What was the environment like for you as a young woman? Just before I got there, the, the men still had the Hawaiian room, which was a tacky drinking place on the fifth floor. And they would go up there between sessions, and they would drink and tell stories and relax. And the, there was nothing like that for the women, and the women were not supposed to go in the Hawaiian room. So, Oh, dear. So there, there was that initial division. That kind of went away over time. It's very different now. It's like any other workplace. Right. Uh, women are accepted at the workplace, and their women are accepted at the, le at the legislature. And we've had uh, a woman speaker. The uh, Senate presiding officer is Susan Beisowitz. Mm. We've had a woman governor. It has changed. Oh, appropriations committee now, very powerful committee. Both uh, chairpersons are women. Wow. In the Senate and in the House. I have to tell you that I never thought twice about being a woman and running for office. That wasn't a concern that I had. I think it's probably because of people like you that came before that set the, the standard. So for me, growing up and seeing people like you in office. It seems normal to you, right? Yeah. It, it never occurred to me that as a woman I couldn't run for office. Well, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Very much. I'm glad it's normal. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, we've got a ways to go, but I think we're getting there. Yep. Focusing in, I guess, on the job of state rep, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the main responsibilities? Well, we do two things. We write laws and we help constituents with their issues. The writing laws part is the first half of the year, basically. A lot of my bills come from constituents. They'll say, why don't you fix this? And then I'll take note, put it in my computer, and then I run the bill later. Okay. But we have to uh, write, the, write the initial version, the short version, and then file it so it gets a number. And uh, then we have to badger the chairman of the committees to get the bill heard because there are too many bills, and the chairman are told to cut it down. Okay. So you have to go and lobby for the bill and, mm -hmm. so you can get a hearing because they really would like the bills to go away. There's too many. Okay. There's about 4000 a year, which is a lot. Yes. And you can only do about uh, 400. So, so, so 9 oh, wow. out of 10 die, and 1 out of 10 makes it. Right. Average. And, uh, so and that's to, 1 out of 10 just to committee. Just, just to get the to start the process, you you need to get the chairman to agree to have a hearing on it. Mm -hmm. Then you need to um, get your witnesses in yep. and teach them to give their statement in under three minutes because that's all they're going to get. So you, I practice with them yep. uh, so they can do their speech in three minutes and then uh, and not to be nervous. And then um, I have uh, other witnesses come in and do present data to the committee, or uh, I'll have allies come in and say why it's a good idea. Um, the bills that have an alliance work better. If you have one person who has one issue, it's not as easy to pass a bill. But if you have a, an alliance and a coalition, it's easier. So I try to build a coalition for the bills. How do you decide when to try to put together a bill? In other words, so a constituent makes a complaint or has an issue or wants something done, What's the process to get to, I'm going to write a bill or try to put a bill together? Well, sometimes you can get it fixed through an agency. You can just talk to the agency and uh, say this problem person has this problem. And sometimes it can be handled internally at the agency. But sometimes it really needs a, a legal change. And then I have to write it up um, and try to move it that way. So 
after the the hearing process, then you have to get the, your fellow committee members to vote for your bill. Yeah. And then it goes to another committee and then another committee. You have to get funding for some of them. Yep. Uh, so I have to talk to appropriations or finance. I'm on finance. I'm on environment, finance, and energy and technology. Okay. So those are the three I'm on. So you have to get uh, the bill to keep moving, and you've got to be watching the timetable. And this all occurs. deadlines for everything. Right, because it, it all occurs in the legislative session. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have to keep the bills moving. Uh, we have, like, a tracking system on the computer, and every day myself and the intern looks to see where the bills are. And are am I coming up to a deadline? Speaking and, of interns, so yes. how many people do you have helping you? I have a one-quarter aide and an intern Okay. Uh, during session. All right. Um, so my aide works for four people. Okay. Um, interns are good. They can help track things and uh, get call the witnesses, get the witnesses ready for speaking. And then uh, it goes to the, it has to go through both chambers, House and the Senate. And finally, we have to get the governor to sign it. So it's a, you know, it's a long process. Yeah. Um, Within a, a short period of time. In a short period of time. In the uh, even-numbered year, we go February to May. And in the odd-numbered year, we go January to June. Same number of bills both years, surprisingly. So in a short session, we have the same number of bills, but compacted. So the deadlines are shorter. Everything is shorter. And uh, we're, so sometimes you'll see that we will write it as best we can and then send it out of the committee, even mm -hmm. though it's not finished. Because of the timetable, the bill has to keep moving. So right. sometimes we'll say, all right, we have a disagreement over this. Let's fix it on the floor. Let's just vote this out tomorrow and fix it on the floor. And then okay. we keep negotiating while the bill is traveling. And then when we get to the floor, by then, hopefully we've Ironed worked out, out some problem and fix the language so that it'll go fast. Okay. So at the end, the clock is your enemy. Right. Now, when we're not in session, I do a tremendous amount of casework, you know, everything from flooding problems to noise problems to housing problems to um, crabby neighbor, well, you name it, it, it comes up. I had one, one person had a hole in the roof, and I was able to um, work with the town to get her a... Uh, reverse mortgage to fix her house. Good. During COVID, there was that time period in March of 2020 for about s six months when there was no vaccine, if you remember that. Oh yes, yeah. And that was very, very stressful. People were on lockdown. They couldn't go to work. Many people, mm -hmm. the non-essential people were on lockdown. They had no income. They were frantic. I had 3,000 unemployed people in Wallingford. Yeah. Suddenly unemployed. Department of Labor was overwhelmed. These people were filing for unemployment compensation. Yep. No end in sight because we didn't know. And they didn't know when they were going yeah. back to work. And they were having to pay their mortgage and they were frantic. So it was like the phone rang. I would put the phone down and it would ring again. I would put the phone. Right. It was like continuously day and night for six months. Yeah. And uh, that's in the summer is when I'm supposed to be working on my other job. <laughs> right. So that was very difficult year because I it was doing my river work at River Advocates and also trying to manage all these folks who needed unemployment help. And there were just thousands of them. One of the things that's really important to me is as we're rebuilding from COVID mm -hmm. and trying to establish our new normal, yeah. um, making sure that the assistance and the money that's coming from the government is actually going to the people versus you know, big corporations or um, people who don't need it. Um, how did you navigate that? Because some of this is federal money and some is state money, you do have to follow the rules. So right. um, one of the biggest problems I had was folks who have a dual type of income. They're a wage earner, they get a wage statement mm -hmm. from, like they work for a, a company or a restaurant or a real estate office or something. And they also have a side business, which they're self-employed. And the help that was being offered to them made them pick one category or the other. That was a really difficult situation because I had to pigeonhole them into one or the other category. They couldn't right. collect for both jobs. I would say, this is the ruling I got. And you know, we had all the lawyers look at it, and, and we had to follow the federal law. So uh, this is Congress probably should have written it differently. But the way they wrote it, you had to pick 
are you self-employed or are you a wage earner? And I had so many people that were in two categories. Right. And, uh, and they would say, well, what about my other income? And I told them they have to pick one, which was made them very unhappy. But that was the best at the time I had to follow the law. So that was, right. you know, until we got um, Congress to understand two job situation. You, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, about negotiating yeah. uh, to get things done, and I'm sure that that was a large part of getting stuff done during COVID as well. How do you go about negotiating with Republicans? Since you're a Democrat, how do you work across the aisle? At the moment, we have a majority in both chambers. I mainly have to negotiate with my fellow Democrats. To, uh, <clears throat> But in some years when we've had a closer mm -hmm. uh, balance, uh, for example, in 2016, 2017, the Senate was evenly divided, and then I would have to work with the Republicans as well to on a budget item, which um, I tried to you know do the best I can with that. I have some very practical Republicans that I work with who are like common sense people, and they they just want to fix the problem. Right. <laughs> There's some on the Energy Committee like that I work right. very well with, Dr. Uh, Bill Pettit from. Um, Southington. Yep. Because he's a doctor, he's got like a very practical attitude towards fixing things. Right. I worked with him on composting, the Energy Technology Committee. Representative Holly Cheeseman uh, is ranking member on finance, and I worked with her on the Brainerd Airport. Uh, she and I are trying to keep it open for training pilots and airplane mechanics because that's a really employable position. Right. A lot of jobs in Connecticut pay really well if yeah. you go to if you go. To, to get trained for that. So we were trying to keep that school open and we were fighting with um, Hartford who wanted the site for uh, property tax creation. And uh, a school on a runway was not good for property tax creation. So um, it's about finding that common ground? Yeah, so if we have common ground and practical goals, um, I can work with them. If they're ideologically very extreme, then it's difficult to work with them. Yeah, so I mean, I, I gravitate toward the people that are practical. Well, that was when we had the uh, evenly divided Senate. Mm -hmm. There were uh, reforms in the budget that were good, and then there were some destructive stuff put in the budget just because people thought they could get away with it. To give an example, one of the reforms we did because the chamber was divided in the Senate was something we had been trying to do for a while, which was to not base so much of the budget on volatile revenues, which come from stock market. Mm. The stock market goes up and down, and the revenues go up and down when the stock market does. And yeah. that's dangerous to write a budget based on an up and down revenue. So we pulled those revenues out separately, and they can only be used for rainy day fund and for uh, helping pay off the pension debt. Okay. But you can't use them for the regular budget programs. Okay. That's a good reform. Right. On the other hand, when we were closely divided that year, somebody in the Senate uh, stuck in an automatic permit for environmental decisions. So after so many days went by, you got an automatic permit. And I was dead set against that. Okay. Because that's dangerous to the public when somebody gets permission to do a discharge just because enough days have gone by. Right. It's dangerous to the public. I just won't accept that. That's an example of something that might sneak by when when the balance is too close. Negotiations, they happen at the end of the session in particular when the clock comes in handy to, just like in basketball, the clock comes in handy when you need to negotiate something to get to the finish line. Because mm -hmm. people see the clock, they realize they have two days left, and they better get down and negotiate. Okay. <laughs> because if the clock gets to midnight on the last day, the bills all die. The last couple of days of session, I run up and down the stairs a lot. I go see the senators. <laughs> I say, okay, I need you to call this bill. How about if we change this sentence? Then will you call the bill? And then, you know, they'll tell me, no, that we won't do it for that. But if you do this we'll call the bill. Or if you call our bill downstairs in the house, then we'll call your bill. So that goes on, you know, we're in the last two days. And if, if we never had the clock and the deadline, mm -hmm. we'd probably never negotiate. But since we do have a deadline, 
You have to. We have to. Otherwise, you won't get anything. Right. So that forces the issue. I think a lot of people are concerned, and a lot of people have said to me, um, even in the short time that I've been door knocking um, for my own campaign, uh, a lot of people are concerned about the vitriol or um, disdain that seems to exist. That's national. I don't see it on the state level. You don't? No. Okay. No, we tend to have a pretty good um, polite relationship, I would say. Uh, when I'm deputy speaker, I have to take turns being deputy speaker. There's, there's several of them. Mm -hmm. We have to have decorum and politeness, and people ask questions through the chair, and then the other person answers. Okay. And you don't get that, like, crazy stuff that you see in D.C. It, well, that's I, good to hear. Yeah, that's my observation. Uh, it's not as uh, vitriolic, definitely, as the federal. Do you have... Uh, a bill or two that stands out in your mind, I'm sure you've passed many, <laughs> or helped pass many, uh, that stands out in your mind as one of your most successful? I did one that was uh, successful for a long time, for 35 years. It is now, uh, needs to be replaced. But when I was uh, chair of the Environment Committee, the state's solid waste handling, the garbage mm -hmm. handling, had collapsed because we found out that the landfills were getting into the public water supply. So we had you know, mass contamination of water supply across the state. We had to shut down the landfills and come up with something else. And that was right when I happened to be chair of the committee. So it, was my, it fell on me to fix it. And it was, uh, we set up a statewide system. I think I had five waste sheds, which were regional agreements in five different parts of the state and all the towns in that group uh, mm -hmm. signed an agreement to send their waste to one facility in that waste shed and also we had mandatory recycling the two went together they had a list of things they had to do recycled by by law then the remainder went to a waste to energy facility okay and then that was reduced down to 10 percent of its volume and then the remaining 10 percent went to a ash landfill. At the end of that long, difficult process, when we picked the five sites, there were people objected to where the sites were, and there was you know, a lot of chaos about that. Yeah. But it was evenly distributed, so every part of the state had to deal with this. And all of the state's waste was handled in the state of Connecticut. Nothing left the state, and nothing came in either. Wow. We had we had exactly the right capacity for the amount of waste we produced. It was wow. all handled internally. So I was very happy with that. And that went on for 35 years. It is now coming to an end. The facility in Hartford, where Wallingford sends its waste now, mm -hmm. is going to close, I believe, in September okay. this year. Most people aren't aware of that. And that means that when it closes, trash collected in each town that goes there now will have to go out of state. It'll go to Ohio or Pennsylvania or Kentucky or even Louisiana. Wow. Every day it'll be shipped out of state hundreds of miles or even thousands of miles if it goes to Louisiana. And that is going to be expensive. Yep. It's going to run a lot of trucks through the state. It's going to be a quality of life problem for us and we're going to be sending it to some undeserving poor town in some other state, yeah. which I think is unethical, personally, for us to send our trash to some poor town in Ohio right. or Kentucky because they're desperate for money. They're taking Connecticut's trash. I really think it's unethical. I'm not the chairman of the committee, so I can't do this package again, but I'm certainly going to make noise mm -hmm. to try to get... Uh, the executive branch and the legislature to deal with this responsibly, have an in-state, uh, using new technology, but in-state handling of our waste so that we don't have to ship on a daily basis to another state, yeah. which is, to me, the worst possible solution. Right. And we can't go back to the old system of landfills because we know they pollute the water, so. Right. Uh, but technology can help us. We have good examples from around the world. Right. And. Uh, 
We have composting facility in uh, Southington that's working really well. There's stuff we can do, but it, it is going to require some state investment. And it's going to require some intertown agreements like we did before. I mean, that's, that's what's necessary. I'm going to have to enlist the uh, current chairs of the Environment Committee because I'm not the chair currently. I'm going to have to get help from the executive branch because I think the state will have to put money up like we did before, put up some state money and get the towns to come in as partners where they also put up money. That, I think right. that's what we have to do. Left to their own devices, the towns will ship waste out of state to whoever they can get to take it. Right. But that's inefficient, it's expensive, and it's not ethical. We can do better than that. We're, yeah. we're an intelligent state. We can do better than that. A huge task. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. We did it before. I mean, it was a lot of work, a lot of squawking. I had a primary over it. It was hard. After we got it going, it worked. We were all set for 35 years facing this problem again. There is a task force working on it right now. Hopefully we will share the new technology and some ideas so that we'll be ready to go in January session. Okay. But it's something you can't ignore. It's people create garbage every day. Right. It has to be picked up. Hopefully I'll be elected. Uh, and November. If you're elected, you'll be dealing with this headache yourself. <laughs> I was going to say. Get so ready. this will be in the upcoming legislative session where this is really going to have to be hammered yeah. out. Assuming I get elected. Um, take you on tours of trash plants. Yes. <laughs> Type of mentorship role do you take with new state reps? Um, usually, I, I work with the ones on my committees. Okay. You know, because I have the most time with them. Mm -hmm. If it's a new member to environment, finance, or, or energy and technology, I'll work with them directly on the committee. How to get the chairman to listen to you. Uh, how to get your witnesses ready. Yep. Um, watching the deadlines, yep. which is really important. If you're sloppy with the deadlines, you can get burned. And you're supposed to watch out for your town's interests as well. I'm supposed to watch the town's budget and where it fits in the appropriations budget. If the town has bonding money requested for sewage treatment plant or um, school construction or water lines, uh, whatever it is, uh, transit-oriented development, whatever, I have to make sure their bonding gets in the package. Right. Um, this year I had money in, the, in there for Gaylord to do an upgrade. Uh, I have to make sure that money stays because from time to time someone else will come in with requests for money and, and if I'm not paying attention, they may take mine out and put theirs in. Regularly, I have to come in and check the list to make sure my town is still on the list. Okay. Um, I have had an occasion where uh, we were we were late on a sewage treatment project, an upgrade, and MDC in Hartford tried to steal our money. Yeah. And uh, I got a tip that they were trying to steal our money. <laughs> and. Uh, Sure enough, it was true. It was true. It was not just a rumor. It was really happening. So then I had to work with my delegation and uh, some other allies yeah. to keep that from happening. And we did. We kept the walling for money safe. But mentoring, you know, when you, you have to, to help the <coughs> freshmen understand the deadlines and the alliances and how you've got to talk to the senators and... Uh, don't be afraid to change if you change some words if you need to to get so and so support. And uh, uh, if if your project is too expensive, maybe you could do it in phases and do one phase this year and another phase next year. Right. You know that kind of thing. It's like practical, practical information. Uh, okay. Don't don't talk too long on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> some people uh, give really long speeches and then people get annoyed with them yep. because the other bills aren't moving. So, you know, keeping your speech concise and not long-winded is good. Mary, I don't think our conversation is going to end here because you have so much insight and information to offer. Thank you very much for uh, being with us. Sure, it was and a pleasure. I want to thank everybody for watching Groundwork with Rebecca Highland. I am running for state representative of the 90th district and we're going to thrive together. Thank you.